The following program is underwritten in part by World's Best Cat Litter. You love your cat, but you don't love the litter box mess. Switch to World's Best Cat Litter and get a cleaner litter box with less hassle and less litter. Find it at Target, Walmart, and in your local grocery and pet stores. Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. And the number is toll free, 1-866-405-8405 to reach out to the dream team. That could be Dr. Debbie or dog father Joey Villani or any one of us. Could be Lori, could be Ladybug the Studio Stunt Dog or Judy. We love hearing from you and it's toll free. Here it is a little slower, 1-866-405-8405. And don't forget, as I always say, you can ask your questions right from the Animal Radio app. Did I mention it was free? The free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. And on today's show, in just a couple of minutes, from the CBS series Lucky Dog, which, by the way, I believe he just won an Emmy for, Brandon McMillan will be joining us. Also, wow, we have a really couple of great experts today. We have Pam Johnson Bennett also joining us. So we have one for the dogs and one for the cats. There you go. Oh. We're not speciest around here. And it also says up there the hottest pet costumes for 2016. Are they going to be? Who's going to be on? Who's going to be on? We're going to have Madonna <laughs> Shee from Fun.com. She's going to come on and tell us about it. All the greatest, latest pet costumes for 2016. Wait, who was that? Madonna, Madonna who? Sheehy. Madonna Sheehy. Okay. Do you know her? No relation to Madonna the singer. No. Okay. That's, yeah, that's I, I didn't know. And I'm you know, probably just, butching uh, her last night. Uh, butching it? There's and, all and, kinds of puns in there, isn't there? <laughs> there really is. <laughs> so you dress your animals up for Halloween. You dress Ladybug up for Halloween every year. I do, yeah, and, do and yeah, and my cat, I want to dress him up, but I know he doesn't really like costumes, but what he does like is a cape, so I just put a cape on him, and he runs around the house like he's super cat. <laughs> you sure he's not just run, running away to get away from the, <laughs> no, the costume? No, he's hoping it falls off. Yeah. No, he struts his stuff. He wants to go to the door. He shows it off. He he sits there like he's just hot stuff. Okay. A- anyway, on the way, we'll have the costume people. Are they going to have giveaways this year? Wait, wait, time out, time out. What's, what do you mean anyway? So are you against, like, dressing the pets up? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you know, I think if you've listened to Animal Radio for any length of time, I think putting clothes on your animal is a little bit ridiculous. But, you know, I'm not. I'm oh, not, come on. It's, I, you know, they're also but functional. Why? why do you say that? Each, it, each to their own. Because I think that's humanizing the animal. But what if they're cold and you put a jacket on them? Well, that's a little different. Okay, well, that's close. Clothing. But like tutus. You know what? There like, is nothing cuter than a pit bull in a tutu. <laughs> I tell really? you, I know some animals that have had little chests full of their costumes, and they go to it all the time. See, listen to Ladybug. But she wants to wear her costumes. They love having the costumes put on. She doesn't See? seem happy about it. I agree. <laughs> I, I, t- I totally agree with that. Okay, well, you know, each to their own, and if you enjoy dressing up your animals, that's perfectly fine. And this is definitely your radio show, because I admit I'm a little crazy about my animal. And in fact, that's, you know, all the pictures that I have on my phone everywhere. They're all of my cat, none of my family whatsoever. Yeah, and we're going to give away two costumes. We are. Yes, we are. Okay. Do you know what costumes we're no, giving away? No, you get to choose. You get to choose your costumes. You choose your costumes. So fun. Isn't that yes. exciting? Yeah. Yes. And for uh, for Robert's segment today, he's going to be talking about the five reasons every day is Halloween in the pet world. Huh? Because things can be scary in the pet world. I don't know. Maybe. He'll, I don't know. He'll tell us. Oh, scary. What are you working on over there in the newsroom, Miss Brooks? Well, next hour, I will be talking about Halloween costumes for dogs. But this hour... We're going to find out um, how weird and bizarre aging is for dogs. Really, it is totally backwards from the rest of the entire animal kingdom. It's weird and bizarre for humans, too. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Well, not yeah, when you look in the it's mirror, it's like, different. whoa. Who is that in the <laughs> Who's mirror? Who is that old person? <laughs> so, uh, Joey, what are you working on? What am I working on? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm on. I'm working on Facebook. Oh, you mean for the show? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what I we're going to be talking about an easy way to get that shedding coat out of your dog. Not, and I'm not just talking about brushing and combing. I'm talking about a little trade secrets here. That's on the way. Let's go to the phones for your calls first. Toll free one eight six six four zero five eight four zero five. Hey Keith, how you doing? Hey, pretty good. How you doing? Good. Where are you calling from today? Uh, actually, Mount. Pleasant, uh, Iowa. I'm just pulling into a Walmart distribution center. I'm a truck driver, so. <laughs> we love ourselves well, some OTR. What's going on with your animal? Oh, she's 13 years old, very vibrant still. Uh, she's a large border collie, uh, 
kind of big bones uh, for a border collie. She um, has hip problems right now, and I'm kind of worried and wondering what I can do to help her. Okay. Now, you're saying she's big bones, so is that a nice way of saying she's overweight? Well, no, no, no. She's, uh, you know, for a border collie, her prime weight when she was young, or she came off a cattle farm in Texas, is mm-hmm. 60 pounds. For a female, that's large for a border collie. The males generally ran around 70 pounds. Okay. Well, I'm just I'm not giving you grief here, Keith, but, you know, definitely weight management is the number one thing that pet owners can do that you can control to make sure your pets are um, having the best mobility they can. So if Absolutely. she's in good weight, perfect. But if, if you know, for, for other dogs that might not be in good weight, before I go to drugs and medicines, I'm going to really push to get weight loss because that's, that's the number one thing. Um, so, you know, are you currently using any remedies, any supplements, anything for her at this time? Uh, you know, I mean, not through the glucosamine stuff at her. I was just more wondering, like, uh, do they have, because she's 13, uh, she was a Frisbee dog all her life, jumping up and mm-hmm. down. And, you know, I mean, it's seven that the doc told me that she was going to have hip problems. And I'm just wondering if there's any, she's having a real hard time getting up and down all the time now. Uh-huh. If there's yeah. anything I can do to alleviate the pain. The weight is oh, under sure. control, but she's still in pain. I okay. can tell, you know. Yeah, and in, in, in her age group, I'll tell you, I have a 13 and a half year old lab, and I'm going through the same thing. And it depends a bit on the degree of discomfort that we're having. If we're getting slow, getting up and down, um, there's a little bit more effort to her movements. It, dogs aren't going to cry, so I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for the slow, um, purposeful movements that they do. And and if we're seeing that, then I may just add in one medication. I may try something as simple as a joint support with a pain medicine my own dog i'll tell you right now i have her on five different things um, because we're, we're wow. losing function we're, we're losing the benefit of these different medicines so we, we'll need to find a spot for your dog somewhere within that I, i'm assuming um, so a joint support absolutely put her on a glucosamine product um, and even beyond that there's hyaluronic acid supplements that can be given in the injection form or even in the liquid form um, there's one called lubricin that we talk about on the show quite a bit so that can help. It's a low-level thing, so it's not going to help that pet that has really horrible arthritic hips and, and be the only thing that's going to f- fix that. So we're going to add in other things. My own dog, I have on Tramadol, which is an opioid-like pain medicine, which is very nice because it has low side effects and it's tolerated really well. Um, and then I'll, I added in a non-steroidal pain reliever for my dog, and there's many out there. You'll need to talk to your vet about this. Make sure that you know she's... Um, healthy. She's got recent lab work, but a non-steroidal pain reliever is really important for a dog that's got a lot of um, arthritic problems, a lot of joint discomfort. There's only so far that supplements will go for those babies, and, and that's where my, my doggie's at. Um, and then beyond that, I'll even add in, um, there's a medicine called gabapentin, and I just recently added that to my dog's regimen, and it's really helped her quite a bit. Um, you know, but that's where we kind of build upon this, and it's what we call multimodal pain management so one medicine doesn't stop pain enough um, in many older pets so we have to kind of dabble in different pathways to try to uh, relieve their discomfort and, and to help them move and so if, if you're new to starting something with her I'm not advocating trying five things like my dog um, but I would definitely see about getting into something that's maybe well tolerated like tramadol or gabapentin and then see about a, um, a non-steroidal with your vet. I appreciate that. Do they make, uh, like a cortisone injections when it gets, you know, I mean, down the road? I mean, yeah. eventually quality of life's gonna come down to where she will have to be put down to understand that. But I mean, she's just so full of life. You know, mm-hmm. I don't see that happening in the next five years. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm going through the exact same things. You know, the, the tails wagon, the jumping and the running for balls is still going on. So, um, for cortisone injections, they're really not the best thing when we're talking about managing pain. Um, we can, if there's a particular joint, we'll sometimes give it an um, intra-articular injection of cortisone, kind of like people. Um, but um, if we're not doing those other steps that I've mentioned, that would be my first line therapy that I would try that. Now, I have looked into, and believe it or not, they actually do stem cell therapy um, for dogs with um, hip dysplasia and arthritis. So that's something, but it's, it's a little bit more of a surgical procedure and probably not, you know, 
routine use for, um, you know, the average pet owner. Um, but, uh, and, and it sounds like your baby's probably not a strong candidate for some of the surgeries that we might get into, like a hip replacement, um, or a, um, another hip surgery called an FHO. Those are some very useful surgeries pet for pets that when we're trying to manage that hip dysplasia and they just can't control it with the, um, medications alone. Um, but yeah, you'd have to weigh that in a 13 year old doggy whether you want to get into a surgery. Well, I very much appreciate your, uh, I'll, I'll look into that intermodal pain management you were talking about and talk to my Absolutely. dad about that. I appreciate your input. Okay. Thanks for the call, Keith, and have a good Thank one. You. you too. Bye-bye. one 405 8405 Hey, Richard, how you doing? Well, our dog has... Dog. Has what? I said dog. Well done. Have what? Here, you talk about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they got... Stuff in their ear. My wife says it's crusty looking. Is it white or black or green? Like little white lumps. Little white lumps. Now, you, you mentioned you have more than one dog, and, and they both have the same problem? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's a little problematic for me because, in general, when we talk about ear problems in dogs, there's not a lot of things that are really contagious and if, if I'm from Vegas so if I'm going to put my gambling chips on the line um, I'm going to say it's a little unusual to have something in both dogs that isn't contagious so the number one thing I'd really go looking for is ear mites um, which are a contagious parasite that can cause ear problems uh, a lot of itchiness discomfort uh, very scratchy pets when they have that but there are other things and we look at anything from infection of yeast. So if both pets are in the same environment, yeah, I guess they could get those. But I, I really want to check out your pets and see if they might have something like ear mites. And, and that's something easily done. Uh, you walk into your local veterinary office and you ask them to take a sample of that and look at it under the microscope. And oh, cool stuff moves around when we find ear mites. I really can't advocate enough that we get at least one of these babies to the vet, but I'd preferably get both of them over there. Okay. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1 866 405 8405. Did you know canine caviar diets are formulated with common health concerns in mind, such as diabetes, cancer, and kidney disease? You see, canine caviar uses low GI carbs, which reduce hunger and prolong physical endurance. Free of GMO, gluten, hormones, steroids, and antibiotics, canine caviar's five-star dog and cat foods are the only alkaline-based foods in the world, and that promotes a healthy lifestyle for your furry family. Find out more at caninecaviar.com. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1 866 405 8405. It's Animal Radio celebrating a connection with our pets toll free. 1 866 405 8405. Don't forget you can also ask your questions from the free Animal Radio app. And we'll go back to the phones for questions for Joey Volani and Dr. Debbie in just a couple of seconds here. And don't forget you can also ask those questions from the free app. If I haven't said that enough, download it now. Uh, what are you working on over there in the newsroom, Miss Brooks? How are Miss Brooks? Well, you know, we do stories all the time about how wonderful it is, uh, how wonderful animals make our lives. And now, another reason that you should always be listening here at Animal Radio, because we have evidence, the proof that you need to know, that the more you know about these research things that we tell you about, the better life that your pet is living. Okay. How cool is that? That is very, very cool. And on the way with Lori Brooks in just a couple of minutes. Also, Pam Johnson Bennett for you cat lovers will be with us. And for you dog lovers, Brendan McMillan from the CBS series Lucky Dog will be with us in just a few minutes. So it's, it's a cat and dog day here at Animal Radio. And, uh, this headline just caught my eye. I had to bring this on air with us. Uh, the headline reads, Major Pet Insurer Says Dog Injuries from Jumping, Running, Slipping, Tripping, or Playing Are Not Covered. What? This is the number one pet insurer in Canada. 
uh, I'll have to get to the name here. Uh, Pet, Pet Secure, I believe, is what it is. Uh, Jamie Richardson and her dog, Muddy, were out playing. And Muddy is a seven-year-old Akita breed and apparently tripped and tore a ligament in her hind leg and uh, went to the veterinarian. The bills were about $4,200, and the insurance company refused to pay. They said that, uh, wow. and it was for only 80%, too. You know, she would have had to pay the other part, too. But they, they denied the claim, saying her policy denied coverage if the dog is injured while jumping, running, slipping, tripping, <laughs> or playing. Oh, jeez. Or just generally being a dog. Yeah. This would make sense if this dog had a previous history or something was documented that there was some ligament instability or the veterinarian found something prior to the onset of the insurance, but I've never heard of that um, in, in a knee injury situation. I've heard that in hip dysplasia, because that is a, a congenitally inherited type problem. Um, well, no, I'm, I'm thinking about like Ladybug, the studio stunt dog, who has, uh, she's had two surgeries for a luxating patella. Would that have been covered? I mean, the, the she... Uh, it depends. Yeah, it depends. And that is one important thing you bring up for pet insurance companies, they have the right to set the parameters with what their policy will cover. Many of them do not cover diseases that have a congenital or an inherited component. Patellar luxation does have an inherited component. Um, it isn't the only thing that affects that. So it would be something I would ask, you know, before you take out a policy, and if you have a breed that is prone to kneecap problems like poodles, Yorkshire terriers, um, or pretty much any terrier, um, you know, what is this going to cover or not? not cover if my veterinarian could find that. And that's where a veterinarian can really help you and say, okay, I'm going to get a poodle type dog. Um, what are some of the diseases that I need to be aware of that could occur? happen during their lifespan and then kind of approach your pet insurance company that way yeah well yeah. you know you think diseases sure but i mean yeah just, but if they fell and hurt themselves or something that, I mean, that's that to me would be why you'd want insurance yeah no let, let's let's throw this out there what if the dog is obese yeah, it's just like humans well, you don't turn away a human uh with a broken with leg, a broken leg point. because Very but is, is that a direction things could be going is that you know if your pet or you are overweight and you don't correct that factor then are you somewhat liable for the potential that you could develop a problem down the road yeah, isn't that I, I, an I interesting thought it is not really to me that's a pandora's box <laughs> i cannot tell you how often i i encounter the situation where a pet owner will come in with a sick pet i'll diagnose a problem and they'll say okay great i'm gonna apply for pet insurance now and i'll find out how much it covers <laughs> and this is after the fact of a pet being diagnosed with a problem that they go to seek out pet insurance, which is kind of the whole, it's not the concept of what insurance is about. So these are all pre-existing conditions they're trying to get covered. Right. Insurance is a managed risk. It's a risk that you take and then you're kind of, kind of paying out for that potential that hopefully nothing ever happens. But if it does, you are insured. It is not an after the fact drive through and say, okay, my dog's been diagnosed with a uh, cancer. So now I want insurance to help me cover. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work. Nope. No. <laughs> Jamie Richardson, she hired a lawyer, and the lawyer says, regardless of whatever the glossy brochure says, always read the fine print. She says, and this is what I've always said, you should put a little money away every month because she's seen so many clients battling insurance companies that it just makes more sense to, if you're disciplined enough to put money into a separate bank account, that maybe even is gaining interest. And she recommends about $50 a month to do that if you can do that. But you got to be really disciplined to do that. And uh, that is the one thing that I do is I do put money away because I don't want to battle the insurance. I don't want to have to deal with maybe pre-existing conditions yep. or loopholes whatsoever. I want to be able to fix my animal as best I can. Your money will cover 100% of whatever happens. It, the only problem with that approach is if you have multiple pets, so every month you should be putting away that same amount per sure, pet. So that sure. is a downfall for that kind of step because that is even harder for people with multiple animals to do. Yep. So I, I think insurance has its place. I, I don't think it's um, the cure-all for everything, and I do think pet owners need to be aware of what kind of things that could come up. And also, what's your preparedness? What would you do if you found out your dog had a splenic tumor? If you're not going to be inclined to pursue surgery, blood transfusions, and so forth, then really is is pet insurance going to be useful to help you offset the cost of something that could cost four or $5,000 when you – Maybe not even going to take that step in the first place. So I think you got to know what your your wishes are and what your kind of uh, uh, I don't want to say your shopping history for what you've done for your other pets along the way. Okay, for Jamie, she canceled her pet insurance plan after four years of paying premiums. So 
I just it's a little bit of both sides there. There's some advantages and disadvantages. If you are disciplined, do what I'm doing. If you're not disciplined, pet insurance is definitely a good solution and answer. You've always recommended pet insurance, so I do, you know I do, but I'm, I'm not like one of those people I wave the, you know the pom poms around. You know I, I do think there are some shortcomings, <laughs> and it's not it's not perfect. It really isn't. Fido Friendly Magazine presents the 8th Annual Month-Long Pet Adoption Tour, Get Your Licks, on Route 66, on the road from September through October. Along with media sponsor Animal Radio and companion sponsors Turf Mutt and Evercare, we travel in our Mercedes Sprinter, provided by Sprinter Rentals from L.A. to Chicago, stopping at shelters along the way to support adoption events. Our community sponsors John Paul Pet, Zeus Pet Toys, Pet Curian, Well Pet, Tito's Vodka, and Vets Best go along for the ride while we bring our giant spinning wheel filled with prizes you can win. Log on to get your licks on Route66.com to find out where the tour stops near you. You can help raise money for your shelter, and you might just find your new forever friend. This is an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. Young girls may be discarding their princess wands for superhero capes this Halloween, but not so in the canine world. The glass ceiling appears to be firmly in place at PetSmart, at least, where career costumes labeled male include firefighter and police officer, and female dogs choose between a pink cowgirl costume or a ballerina tutu. So, to be fair, a number of the costumes there at PetSmart range from lobsters and pumpkins and dinosaurs. Those do bear the male, (laughs) female, or unisex label. Mm -hmm. Now, you're thinking, it's kind of crazy, right? Sure. Scott Lowry hosted a podcast on gender issues and said, it might seem silly on the surface, but this really is part of a larger message that we're sending You know, that there are certain jobs for men and certain jobs for women. He plans to dress his two dogs as the cop duo Cagney and Lacey this month and says he did a double take when he saw PetSmart's police officer costumes marked for males. He clicked around and then noticed there was a pattern. Career-related costumes were often explicitly marked either male or female, and then they are even constructed exactly the same way. It's kind of unisex, but they put male or female on it. Hmm. Still, the most popular costumes for pets were gender neutral. They were pumpkins, hot dogs, and bumblebees. Now, in addition, there is another kind of sexist angle to this, if you will. Last year, the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs found that items marketed to girls and women, humans, were routinely marked up an average of 7% more compared to items for boys and men. And it turns out that those markups are not limited to humans. At Party City, Supergirl and Wonder Woman dog costumes were priced 30% higher than Superman costumes and Batgirl costumes. Pet costumes have been gaining popularity in recent years, with 16% of Americans saying they will dress up their dogs, cats, and bunnies for Halloween this year, according to the National Retail Foundation. How many percent? What was that? How many? 16% of Americans say they will dress up their dogs, cats, and bunnies. That's not a lot. I'm surprised it's not higher. Yeah, that is. That is. I, you know, you would think it is higher, but it gets so much attention that it seems like it is. Uh-huh. You know, I just think people aren't admitting it. They're afraid to and say I, they're I, going yeah. to. I find it's hard to find a big girl size costume for my large dog. <laughs> I kind of get that XXL and I'm looking, I think I need a triple XL for her. <laughs> Poor Nikki. Oh, gosh. Well, Californians who see an animal trapped in a hot car can now, without fear of being sued or breaking the law, break a window to set the animal free under a new bill that has been signed into law there. Rescuers can legally break into the car as long as there is no other way to free the animal and it appears to be in danger and the car is locked and law enforcement isn't arriving fast enough. But the one thing, if you do break into the car... You must stay on the scene until law enforcement arrives there. Hmm. But at least it's, I mean, that's a good passage of a law. Sure. Hopri, the Human Animal Bond Research Initiative, we love this group. They have announced that for the very first time, they now have data to show that when 
we know how good pets are for us, that we are more likely to take better care of the pets. In their latest survey, when asked how knowledge of new scientific research on the human-animal bond affected their actions, 89% of pet owners said they were more likely to take better care of their pets. 75% said they were more likely to get that pet microchipped. 74% said they were less likely to give up a pet for any reason. And nearly 90% said they were more likely to provide their pets with higher quality nutrition. Now, the survey also asked pet owners about increasing support for pet ownership in society. 84% agree health and life insurance companies should give discounts for owning a pet. 87% said they would be more likely to buy products from pet-friendly businesses. And 88% agree doctors and specialists should go ahead and recommend pets to patients for healthier living. Well, I second that. All in favor? <laughs> I. I'm Lori Brooks. Get more breaking animal news anytime at AnimalRadio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. Hi, friends. This is Dr. Marty Becker, America's veterinarian. As you know, going to the vet can be a traumatic experience for your pet, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, vet visits can be something your pet looks forward to. Introducing Fear Free. When your veterinarian is Fear Free certified, you will be assured your pet's vet visit is more free of fear, anxiety, and stress than ever before. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified, and it puts the treat into treatment. To find a certified Fear Free veterinarian near you, go to fearfreepets.com. You're listening to Animal Radio. If you missed any part of today's show, visit us at animalradio.com or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Animal Radio celebrating the connection with our pets. I think we do it just fine. If I wanted a celebration, this is the kind of celebration I'd want. I celebrate my pet every day. Toll free 1-866-405-8405. Lori, just a few minutes ago, you reported that there's there seems to be a problem with sexist Halloween costumes. Yes, sir. But everything for women is more expensive. To get our, you know, laundry. Uh, That's not know, fair. I know. Yeah. That's not fair. I, I know in, in Washington, D.C., they're doing away with what they call the tampon tax. Really? Um, yeah, no tax on tampons <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, when, when you're talking about dogs or humans and you have female costumes that are more expensive... Then the male costumes, for whatever reason, that's just, uh, something's wrong there. That's just wrong. And of yeah. course, I think it's all crazy because I'm not the kind of guy that dresses up my animals. I think that's silly, but you know, I respect anybody that does that. I dress my pet every year. You dress up Ladybug. What was I she see. last year? Last year she was, uh, like a, a little, um, horse jockey. Oh, yeah. And she had a little jockey on her back, so when she walked, it was like the jockey was riding riding her as a horse. She had like a saddle and stuff. So, yes, it was very cute. How cute. Well, yes. What were your dogs dressed up last year, Dr. Debbie? My uh, Nikki was a skeleton, so she was like a scary boy thing, and she's a girl. I had no problem with that. And then Boss was Superman. Like super, <laughs> super dog. <laughs> <laughs> Lori, did you dress up your animals, or are you with me on this? No, I'm absolutely not with you on that, Hal. Okay. Um, but no, I don't dress up my dogs, because I dress them up all the time, because you know I make collars for dogs, so um, and costumes for shelter animals to get them more attention, so my dogs are always putting on some kind of clothing and having their pictures taken. Mm. Every day's Halloween here. Yeah. We have Madonna She. She works with a website called fun.com. She's the lead brand specialist. It's a pretty cool name there and she uh, i guess the site there they have costumes for pets and we welcome her to the show hi madonna how are you good how are you guys this is the first time i ever thought i'd say hi madonna on the radio show <laughs> well, congratulations <laughs> you guys sell costumes right yeah we um our parent company is fun.com but we also run halloweencostumes.com so it's definitely our busy time of year right now for humans and animals we heard in uh, statistics during the news that only 16% of Americans dress up their animals for Halloween. I bet you feel it's a little more than that, huh? I know. That's a surprising number. But also, like I heard you say, some people dress their animals up year-round, so maybe that kind of skews it, too. Like, 
is not counting the people like me who put their animals through this type of torture in the not in October months, too. <laughs> no, don't use that word, torture. They love it. <laughs> so, I don't know. I tried to put a bonnet on my cat the other day, and he didn't care for that very much. <laughs> yeah. What costumes are big sellers this year or last year, or what are the best ones, do you think? This year, we really noticed that people like to buy um, other animal types of costumes for their dogs. Oh, so, huh. like, um, we have a lion mane. That one's really popular for us, as well as um, we have a spider costume for dogs. That one does really well. But my other favorite is food items. So we have a taco costume that oh, yeah. I know lots of people like. So now, do you think there's any sexism with the costumes? Because that's a big issue we just heard about in the news that uh, there's a lot of, it seems to be like uh, gender-specific costumes like a policeman and uh, or a police dog, I guess it would be, and yeah. uh, construction uh, workers. You know, I really don't, going through our stuff online, we don't... Um, section out our category by boy costume girl costume and like i said the majority that we sell are items like other animals or food you know so you're not going to be like oh here's a you know boy lion versus a girl dinosaur i really think if you want to dress your dog up as superman and it's a little girl we're not going to stop you yeah i hear you happy (laughs) more power to you happy exactly Or if you have and a little would, boy dog and you want to put a tutu on him, go for it. Yeah, there's yeah, nothing wrong with that. I'll make oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that we have two giveaways today from, is it Halloween.com? Halloween Costumes. Halloween Costumes. Halloween And so I'm encouraging listeners, if you want to get uh, your animals dressed up this year, definitely head on over to the website. We're going to have two giveaways now. Are they of specific costumes? No, you can take whatever you want. Ooh. We have Star Wars. We have Minions. Toll free, one 405 8405 right now if you want to pick up on these costumes from HalloweenCostumes.com. Do you have human costumes, I assume, also? Yes, we do. Do you have, have matching? Quite a few more. Um, yeah, and that was another thing that I was thinking to say, too. We see a lot of families, including the pets, into their group costumes. So we have a lot of fun Star Wars costumes. So like the mom and dad could be, you know, Han Solo and Leia and then have a little Yoda dog. (laughs) Do you, uh, do you, uh, uh, hold on. The dog in here is very excited about the Yoda costume. As soon as you said the Yoda there, there was, I think we know what uh, Ladybug's going to be this year. Uh, There I go. It's all decided. (laughs) Did you know canine caviar diets are formulated with common health concerns in mind? such as diabetes, cancer, and kidney disease. You see, canine caviar uses low GI carbs, which reduce hunger and prolong physical endurance. Free of GMO, gluten, hormones, steroids, and antibiotics, canine caviar's five-star dog and cat foods are the only alkaline-based foods in the world, and that promotes a healthy lifestyle for your furry family. Find out more at caninecaviar.com. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at one 866 It's Animal Radio, celebrating the connection with our pets. And today we, we're not dog-centric or cat-centric, we're getting both sides today. We have a couple of great experts, just happened coincidentally this way. Brandon McMillan from CBS's Lucky Dog will be joining us next hour. This hour, probably the foremost cat psychologist, at least that I know, Uh, That would be Pam Johnson-Bennett. She's joining us. Hi, Pam. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, welcome back. You have a brand new book called Cat Wise. Yes, we're, I still keep trying to get people to get a little smarter about their cats. Well, now, (laughs) here's the thing. Can you really train a cat? I think they're easier than dogs to train. Really? Wow. How's that? Because cats are food motivated. They're hunters. So if you use food, it's, it's a, built-in tool for you to use so they're they're actually very easy to train and they're smart the thing is you have to give them a choice a lot of times we force animals to do things and you can't win by forcing and by using fear you have to give them a choice and give them a a road map to success Mm. you know when you ask a friend to help you move an apartment you know for for a six-pack of beer or a pizza help me move (laughs) That's what my cat looks at me like when I, whenever I wanted to do anything. 
<laughs> well, I think maybe the beer and the pizza you're offering might be the problem. <laughs> yeah. Since you're the, uh, the the best cat shrink I know, I want you to answer this question, this phenomenon that happens that's so bizarre. I have friends that come over. They're allergic to cats. They don't want anything to do with my cats. And Judy, when she comes over, they stay away from her. And, and I love cats. She loves cats. She likes to pet them. She really loves to give them attention. They don't want anything to do with me. But my, my and, na- neighbors just... They don't want anything to do with the cats, but the cats always go to them and sits on their lap. And it's common sense if you think about it. Cats are territorial, and and our house is their territory. And they want to make sure when someone comes in, they have to have time to decide is this friend or foe. And a lot of times the cat lovers don't give them a chance. They just charge right over and want to pet them right. and the cat hasn't had time to go hey wait a minute let me you don't smell like anyone else that i know in this house whereas the person who's allergic or the person who hates cats does not make eye contact does not make any overtures for the cat and that gives the cat an opportunity to come up and do a scent investigation and cats are all about scent okay so i gotta just ignore him no eye contact you gotta, yeah let him make the first move let him come to you it's all about choice And that applies to anything. The more choice you give a cat, the less behavior problems you're going to have. When I sit down to do some work in front of a computer and I have all my papers laid out and everything and I'm really intense in my work, for some reason, the cat that wouldn't give me attention earlier in the day now needs to sit on my keyboard or on my papers. Why? Oh, they're smart, aren't they? They know. (laughs) It's because that's where your focus is, Ah. and they want to be where your focus is, and you're kind of like a a captive audience right there. And so they sit on the the newspaper you're reading or the magazine or the papers you're writing on or right across your keyboard. And a lot of times you may be talking on the phone or – and they think, well, I don't see anyone else in the room. They must be talking to me. So let me go over and be right in the center of attention. So it's, again, a, they're very smart. I have a question I, if I wanted to, as a veterinarian, you know, I see a lot of different house soiling issues. What, what percentage of your work is related to elimination problems versus maybe just more of a pure behavioral uh, cat interaction problem? Oh, my gosh. We're, we're talking like 85, 90%. Wow. Is, is the really elimination high. problems. Really? And, and many times, that's not the original problem. That's a result of another problem. It might uh-huh. be that the cat is eliminating outside of the litter box because somebody else brought a new cat in and didn't do a good introduction, or they moved to a new house, uh, or there's been punishment, or the cat is afraid of something. So, you know, sometimes, yes, it's because the litter box is dirty, and of course, you know, there are, there are the medical issues. But many times, the cat is doing that because there's something else going on. So we have to look at that. We have to look beyond the box. The new book is called Cat Wise. Our guest is Pam Johnson Bennett. And my last question happens to be the biggest question we get here on the toll-free lines. Why is it my cat is no longer using the litter box? She's been using it all the years. All of a sudden, is no longer using it. Okay, I have a three-step. It's going to sound simple. But number one, you take your cat to the veterinarian to rule out medical issues. Even if you're sure it's behavioral, you do not skip that step. Okay. The second step is look at the litter box set up itself. Is it clean? Has the cat grown? Is this a, a box that was good when he was a six-month-old kitten, but now that he's a two-year-old overweight cat, is it not working? Uh, have you made changes in the environment where that litter box is no longer uh, acceptable? So... First, medical. Second, look at the setup itself. And third, what's happening in the dynamics in the household? Have you added another cat? Is your house becoming chaotic? Did you move? Um, Has something happened that's traumatic for the cat? So you look at those three things, and that's the order you go in. First, definitely going to the vet and making sure there's not a medical problem, like what could be a urine infection or... There are so many things. There are so many things. And many times people will call me and say uh, they haven't gone to the vet because they're sure it's behavioral. They're sure the cat is is mad at them or getting back at them for something. (laughs) So please don't assume it's behavioral because if it isn't, 
you're causing your cat to suffer unnecessarily. Good words. Pam Johnson Bennett joining us. If you want to pick up, I have 10 copies right now of this fabulous book called Cat Wise. Toll free one eight six six four zero five eight four zero five. If you can't get through, not lucky enough to to win one of the copies today, head on over to Amazon.com and look it up. Catwise, W I S E, Catwise, a great new book from Pam Johnson Bennett. And Pam, thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. We're gonna head back to, of course, anytime. We're gonna head back to the phones for your calls right now. This is Animal Radio. If you have cats, I bet you didn't realize there's a connection between common health problems in cats to the type of litter you use. Ammonia forms in the litter box and can cause vomiting, diarrhea, drooling, panting, and even upper respiratory infections. You can stop this by switching to Cats Incredible Litter. It has patented technology that stops ammonia from forming, with all profits going to help animals in need. Available now at your local pet store and Petco stores nationwide. Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. Welcome. This hour, Brandon McMillan from the CBS hit series, Lucky Dog. He just picked up an Emmy. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't realize that they gave Emmys for that, but they do, apparently. He's uh, done a fine job really representing the dogs on CBS every Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. He says he can train your dog, or you can train your dog, within seven days to do the basics. What are the basics? You should know the basics. Sit, stay, down, come, off, heel, and no. And before they learn any other... Any other tricks? They need to know these basics. Yep. And we'll be asking him about that in just a couple of minutes right here on Animal Radio. I also want to know what his style is. Because, you know, there's the Caesar Milan style, which is kind of... Uh, Controversial. The discipline. Way yeah. Yeah. And then there's... Dominance. The, dominance. Yeah, that's really what it is. Victoria Stillwell, she's more of a treat-based... Positive reinforcement. Positive yeah. reinforcement is what mm-hmm. they call that. I'm glad you ladies had the, the proper names, <laughs> what I was trying to say. The words are all there. You put them in order. Brandon will be with us talking about his brand new book and his first book, I believe. Did you know he's uh, bi-coastal? Not a lot of people know that. There's nothing wrong with that. No, there isn't really anything wrong with that. We're pretty open-minded here at Animal Radio. What else is happening this hour? That's it. No, that's new. Laura, you're working in the newsroom. You've got something. I, Hopefully I, you can beat I, it. I'm trying to get some work done, but I'm having so much fun, Hal. It's uh, been difficult. <laughs> We're going to find out. You know, there's such that such a debate about uh, what kind of animal can really be a service animal. And people fudging with um, taking a, an animal on a plane, saying that it is their emotional support animal. So they are having meetings going on in Washington. And we'll tell you what the airline is wanting to do about which animals they want to allow. Only, like, two types of animals. Are they going to ban we'll my service are. ferret? Because if they're going to ban mm-hmm. my service ferret, I don't know. I've just got the little bag. Imagine everything that goes over here. You have to wait a minute, and I'll tell you. (laughs) Good luck keeping it on them. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, let's go to the phones for your calls. Toll free, 1-866-405-8405. Don't forget, you can also ask your questions from the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. Let's head on over to Belinda. Hey, Belinda, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. Where are you calling from today? I'm calling from Bellflower, California. Oh, the L.A. area. So how are you doing? What's up? I got the whole team here. We can help Um, you. Hi. I'm calling. I have a almost five-year-old Savannah that um, has a clothing fetish. Wait, wait, Um, wait. Is that a cat? A cat. cat. Yeah, that'll be my call there. Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, She, when she was around two, she started um, eating, like, material, like towels, clothing, uh, blanket. Um, I mm-hmm. can't keep any towels or toilet paper, anything in the bathroom. Um, I took her to two vets. They couldn't find anything wrong with her. Mm-hmm. And then uh, about a year after that, she stopped eating. And when I took her in, they thought she was plugged up because I never found any evidence of any of the material that she ate. And they couldn't find anything. They did exploratory surgery, and they just said she had a severe food allergy. Okay. And she still, although I don't leave anything out, so she hasn't been doing this for about a year. And I think it's because there's nothing for her to chew on okay, <laughs> anymore. Okay. But I don't. I didn't know if it was like a food, like she was missing something in her diet. Right now she's on a hypoallergenic diet because of the food allergy. 
Okay. When we have a kitty that's chewing on fabrics, we call that wool sucking. Um, some will just suck on fabrics. Others will chew or try to ingest that. But it's, it's a complicated disorder. And in many cases, we do feel that it is an obsessive compulsive disorder. And there can be some genetic traits um, kind of you know, linking towards this. And we do see it a lot in some of the oriental breeds. And um, savannas can have oriental breeds within that. So for those that don't know, a savanna is a hybrid cat, um, serval mixed with a domestic short hair. And sometimes they have the asa cats or the oriental short hairs mixed in there. Um, but this obsessive compulsive disorder, if it's not something like that, it can also be something digestive a food allergy and malabsorptive problem. So I do like the fact that your kitty is on a hypoallergenic diet. And for some cats, that or the um, higher level treatments, if we have inflammatory bowel disease present, um, medications to suppress that um, may be in order. If that's not the case and they didn't feel she had a huge inflammatory bowel disease component, then you know the diet might be the only thing we need to do medically and then look at what other things that we can do to treat um, the wool sucking. And the number one thing that I like that you said is that you've restricted access to those items. Something as simple as towels or clothes, laundry laying around, those kind of things, just having those out of way and not around can help to eliminate that behavior. And there are some thoughts that by increasing other alternate oral behaviors, because it can have an obsessive component, so some cats just need to chew on something, whether it be, you know, a doggy rawhide, a lamb ear, providing them with kitty grass can be helpful for some cats. I did buy her about a year and a half ago. Um, uh-huh. One of those large, large dog bones um, I yeah. got at one of the restaurants. I mean, it was huge. Mm-hmm. And um, I let her know on that for quite a while. I mean, she worked that over. And yeah, and that's, that, that's another one. That was just something that I figured, well, she's going to chew. I even gave her a couple of Kong toys. Good. That, um, <laughs> I was trying to think of things, too, but I just, because I couldn't figure out why she was doing it. It was very frustrating. And yeah. like I said, since since she's had the surgery, which was, it's been about two years now, a year and a half, um, she hasn't had that problem. But then again, I haven't left anything out for her. Good. And be that might be interesting because the diet plus your changes, you know, may have been successful enough right now that you don't have to look at some of the other steps that we would do. But, you know, some of those other things, you know, making sure that, um, uh, you know, everything's picked up, um, the environment, we enrich that. So, you know, just making sure everything is as stress-free as possible. And some cats with wool sucking, it'll actually be triggered after after a stressful event or some kind of household change. But the vast majority of cats that do this, it actually starts at puberty. So just at a couple months of age is when this behavior starts to kick in. And oh, yeah. uh, you... She went, it was about a year and a half, two years when she started. And the lady I got her from said, oh, it's a phase she's going through. And I'm like... And after two years, I'm like, yeah, this is a really long phase. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. And, you know, in my practice, I tell you, over 50% of the cats that have this behavior are, are Siamese. Um, the other ones will be Burmese and the other Oriental breeds. So it, mm-hmm. it is very common in these guys. And sometimes we do have to pull out medications such as Kitty Prozac um, or uh, Clomipramine is another one that I'll, I'll use with this kind of behavior if we, we don't get the, the help we need with the environmental changes. Well, I think the sounds... food might have helped because, like I said, she hasn't. I have a blanket that's missing, um, you know, about a foot swatch out of it. And oh no! I used to have a Siamese cat that would chew his tail, and mm-hmm. well, so much so that it would lick, it would tear the hair off. It was, it was mutilating itself. And, it, and that's a very similar that, kind of behavior, yeah. Wow. Uh, an obsessive compulsive behavior where they'll, where they'll suck and chew on their tail, and almost um, you know, kind of like a security blanket. It's their little pacifier they're chewing I understand. On. I'd say my cat used to suck and chew on my fingers, my little finger, and he would just close his eyes and just <laughs> chew and chew and chew. <sighs> okay, well, let's head back to the phones. Toll free, one eight six six four zero five eight four zero five. Whether you have a exotic cat like Belinda there, the Savannah, or you have... Uh, an iguana or a flamingo. Dr. Debbie's pretty well versed and she can help you out. In fact, she's uh, practices in Vegas. One of these days she's going to stop practicing and actually do it for real. Uh, but she, 
<laughs> she, she sees a lot of different strange animals because Vegas is full of different strange animals. Uh, among the animals that she sees, well, the Yorkshire Terriers, the Shih Tzu, the Pug, the Mini Schnauzer, all very exotic dogs. And she has, in fact, written books about all of these dogs, How to Be Your Dog's Best Friend. And you can find them over at Amazon, uh, the Kindle books over there. And, of course, we have links at AnimalRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, Animal Radians. It's Robert Semro, your Pet World Insider, here with this week's Animal Radio List. Five reasons every day is Halloween in the pet world. So you may think Halloween is one day a year, and I'll agree that's true on the calendar. However, I've been pondering this notion for a while, and as I explored it, I have now concluded and am ready to declare this here on Animal Radio, every day is Halloween for the pet world. Think about it. What is Halloween known for? Treats, dressing up, walking the neighborhood and seeing friends, and greeting them with a huge smile of internal warmth. On top of that, the kids in our lives can't wait to get out and walk the neighborhood. Well, that's how most days go for those with pets. Our fur kids are dressed up each day, ready to get out of the house and on a walk, and they can't wait to see the neighbors. Each morning, regardless of whether you have a dog, cat, bird, or other pet, you wake up to an energized being ready to get moving. They have more enthusiasm than you, and they can't wait to get started. Dogs in particular are at the front door asking, begging, even demanding that we get going on a walk around the neighborhood. Dogs stop at most of the houses to sniff the scented treats that have been left behind by other dogs. They let each other know where the good houses are and the ones to skip. That's the kind of teamwork and camaraderie that all kids have on Halloween. Which house is giving out the good candy, and which house is giving out boxes of raisins? Ugh, oh, I'm still haunted by boxes of raisins. Next is the dressing up. That's right, for many it's a chance to be something different, whimsical, scary, or just simply have fun. The same holds true in the pet world. Yes, there are outfits, costumes, blingy collars, pet paints, and so much more that are more common than ever. And just like children, some pets love this activity of getting dressed up to see their adoring public and to shine like the stars they are. One more similarity is that many children are pushed around the neighborhood in strollers to trick or treat. So, too, are many dogs and cats these days. It's not a rarity anymore, and I predict that pets being pushed around in strollers may become an epidemic within the next 100 years. Halloween is all about the treats, and so, too, are the pets in our lives. Every day is filled with a quick stop-off at the desk, at the table, on the sofa. It's like Halloween. Instead of trick-or-treating, we know exactly what our pets are doing. Licks for treats, which is best translated as, I'm going to give you kisses and loves because I know that ends with a tasty treat or two. Okay, all kidding aside, Halloween really is every day for anyone with pets, and we receive treats galore without the cavities. Share your everyday as Halloween thoughts on our Animal Radio Facebook page. People say less is more. At Red Barn, we think less is better. It's what you won't find that sets our natural premium pet food apart. No byproducts, no corn or soy, no fillers. Just the natural ingredients your pets need to live the healthy life they deserve. Look at the label. We want you to. Red Barn Naturals Pet Food. Simply the best. Find it in your local pet specialty store. Red Barn canned food for cats and dogs is grain and gluten free. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1 866 405 8405. It's Animal Radio. Celebrating that connection with our pets. You know that connection. You look in their eyes, they give you that unconditional love, and you're you're in love. That's it. Nothing in the world will get between you and your cat, your dog, your ferret, your iguana, even your turkey from that point on. That's how uh, animal human love grows. <laughs> what I'm what, yeah, I was say, what are you even saying, <laughs> now? Okay, I'm a little excited. Brandon <laughs> McMillan is on in just a few minutes, and usually it's the ladies that get excited for uh, this kind of... Uh, He's a looker, and he has that CBS TV series, an Emmy Award winning. See, Nike, yeah, agrees. Nike even agrees. Yeah. And Nike's a cat. Uh, he has that show called Lucky Dog. He just won an Emmy Award for that, and uh, he also hosts Discovery Shark Week on Animal Planet. 
he was actually born into a family of trainers and entertainer, and he's been working with uh, you know animals all his life. He's trained over three hundred Hollywood productions with uh, animals, pets, and I believe he's uh, also sort of the celebrity trainer too. He deals with Ellen DeGeneres' dogs, a Rod Stewart's dog, Snoop Dogg's dog, <laughs> <laughs> Snoop Dogg's dog. <laughs> I need to give him one of the bulldogs here to try and train. Yeah, you do. You really do. You have some. Uh... They are not easy. I mean, I have. I know friends who are going on years trying to potty train these guys. It's Ooh. not easy. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think it's all that oxygen. You know, lack of oxygen. <laughs> doesn't <laughs> well yeah i mean i think they've uh, lack of oxygen they've linked towards a lot of problems with heart problems and people and um blood disorders and so forth so gosh you know i, I can see why it might be the last thing they're thinking about is oh i gotta walk over there right and over there <laughs> i just trying to breathe man <laughs> <laughs> okay let's go to the phones which one are we going to uh, all five are lit up here we're going to line three with mike hey mike welcome to the show i have dr debbie right here for you Hi, how are you doing today? Good. Great. Yeah, we, we had a little incident a couple weeks ago where our dog, medium-sized dog, uh, decided that a rawhide chew bone was something that you devour and not chew on. Oh, and, yeah. and when I looked over, I could tell the dog was choking because it was thrashing its head around. So I, you know, I mean, I know how to do CP, uh, you know, CPR on a dog from the sides of the chest, but I was like, dumbfounded, and I know the Heimlich for humans, but I was dumbfounded how you would do it on a dog. So I had to just dive down and stick my hand down her throat as far as I can get it, and luckily I was able to grab it and pull it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, uh, life would have been much simpler with a Heimlich technique. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, it, that comes into play when we have an airway obstruction lower than the mouth. So if that was in the mouth or in the upper airway, and you can reach that and access that with your hands safely without losing your fingertips, um, then that's really kind of the first step. If that doesn't work, then we move to the Heimlich. And, uh, you know, in dogs, there's a lot of different techniques. You can do basically a modified human Heimlich. Um, so if you have a small to medium-sized dog, you're basically um, going to reach up under the rib cage and kind of give three to five quick motions, um, thrusts into the abdomen like you would for a person. Now, if it's a bigger dog and you're a big person, you can still do the same thing, although for some large dogs, it can be a little hard to kind of handle and apply those compressions. So you can uh, basically lie them on the ground and apply lateral compression to the chest and near the back end of the chest, and that can give you enough force because dogs are a little different than people. Um, We compress from the sternum when we're doing, you know, chest compressions and CPR, you press down into the chest. And in a dog, their chest doesn't really squish that way really effectively. So from the side, you can get some really good um, compressions that way in dislodging and just getting the force of that push going. So, okay. oh gosh, so scary. So, uh, well, it sounds yeah, like now you're I still going to feed raw- that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that gets your heart going. Now, what's your uh, feeling on rawhides? I don't think it's good for uh, bigger dogs. I don't know. I mean, maybe smaller dogs, smaller mouths, they know to chew, to be chewing on it. But big dogs, I just think they, it, right down, they look at it as another bone. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there are some goods and bads with that. Um, definitely the dental exercise. You know, one thing for people that love rawhides and like their dogs to get that exercise, if you're not directly supervising like you were, I would never, ever, ever feed that kind of product for your pet. Um, right. But even even with cautions, there are some other rawhide styles that might be maybe a little bit less tendency for uh, choking. And those are the compressed rawhides, which are the really heavy duty, not the chopped up rawhides that they squish into cute little shapes, but right. it goes under high pressure where it's really thick and heavy, and there's not those little knots on the end where they can get those little pieces caught. But that might be one other alternative that has less of a choking uh, potential for you. Okay. Well, I thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks for your call today, one 405 8405 That is toll-free, directly to Groomer, Joey Volani, and Dr. Debbie. This healthy serving of Animal Radio is brought to you by the grain-free Red Barn Naturals canned food for dogs and cats, always made in the USA with natural, functional ingredients to support your pet's optimal health. Learn more about them over at redbarninc.com. And thanks so much, Red Barn, for underwriting Animal Radio. I'm going to pepper spray you in the face. 
Oh, thank you. Alan Cable, it's time for today's kook watch. Thank you for leaving my kayak alone. This lady in Alaska thinks a bear can understand what she's saying. I'm going to pepper spray you in the face. That's what I'm going to do to you. Huh. I don't think the bear liked it. Go away. No. Get away from the kayak. If she just would have left the bear alone, he probably would have walked away. Stop it, bear. Stop it. Bear. 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 You're breaking it. Why are you breaking my kayak? Why did you pepper spray me? I don't know about you, but if I were the bear, I'd be running from her voice. Why are you here? Incredible as it may seem, the bear isn't talking. Oh, bear! Why does she keep calling me bear? My name's Bobby. Bear! Oh, bear! And I thought Goldilocks was annoying. Bear! This is Animal Radio, baby. The Movie Man six-second review starts now. Look, I like me a good Western, and the Magnificent Seven aren't magnificent, but they're still pretty good. The Mink! Just because you don't have time to read a book doesn't mean you can't enjoy stories about artists and groups that you love. To discover a whole new world of audiobooks and hear the stories that made the music, visit HappyLandAudio.com. That's HappyLandAudio.com. This is an Animal Radio News Update, brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. As pet owners, uh, we've all had to deal with the depression and sadness of watching our furry companions age and slow down and then had to say goodbye much sooner than we wanted. But apparently, the dog aging process is not really normal. For one certain biologist, how dogs age doesn't make sense because in the animal world, larger animals live longer than smaller ones. Except for dogs, right? Tigers outlive domestic house cats. Killer whales outlive dolphins. Humans outlive chimpanzees. You get the pattern there. However, within the dog species, the opposite is true. The smaller dogs live a lot longer. A tiny chihuahua can live up to 18 years, while a huge Newfie or Newfoundland lives to be only about 10. Well, now biologist Daniel Primslow has started the Dog Aging Project at the University of Washington. And right now, they are working on getting a big grant that would allow them to conduct this huge study on dog aging that would involve about 10,000 dogs from all over the country. Think about it. Dogs, he says, are the most phenotypically variable species in the world, according to Promslow. Just go to the dog park and you see the variability in in every way, in terms of size, shape, color, coat, and behavior. So now the project is recruiting dogs of all kinds, large and small, purebreds, mixed breeds, young and old. They are also interested in dogs from really geographically diverse parts of the country and from households of different socioeconomic backgrounds. So they're looking at all dogs. They want you to help. You see, there are several easy metrics for measuring aging in humans. For example, you can measure human frailty by seeing how quickly a person can get out of a chair in what's pretty much a standardized test. But there's really no such chair test for dogs, which makes it hard to evaluate how well or how poorly that dog is aging. The project, by the way, is also testing whether a drug called rapamycin can help out dogs aging better with better heart health. But that's a separate study. You can find out more about both of these at dogagingproject.com. Oh, turkeys, pigs, and even roosters have flown the friendly skies. We've heard so many of these stories. Carried onto commercial planes by passengers who identified their furry and feathered friends as emotional support animals. However, a committee of airline representatives and disabled rights advocates continues their meetings in Washington, D.C. Seriously, trying to come up with some new rules on what types of animals should be permitted on planes and what types of documents need to be required in order to prove those animals are legitimately needed. Airlines recognize two types of animals that can accompany passengers free of charge, being service animals, such as seeing eye dogs, and emotional support animals, which help comfort travelers who have psychological or emotional mental illnesses or conditions. The debate among members of the Accessible Air Transportation Advisory Committee 
focuses on what type of animals can be recognized as emotional support animals. The National Multiple Sclerosis Society, among others, suggests limiting emotional support animals to only dogs, cats, and rabbits, while other organizations, including the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, they would like to add birds to that list, but not chickens, ducks, or turkeys. Why? The airlines say uh, too many passengers falsely claim that their pets are emotional support animals. The major air carriers want to recognize only dogs and miniature horses as service animals and require that all animals be kept in pet containers or carriers during the flight. That is species. I'll tell you that right now. If a turkey makes me feel better, <laughs> or in an autistic kid, if it makes him feel better, I don't see why. Or a pet chicken. It doesn't matter. What that's species. Totally. I'm sorry. Just yeah, but you know they they are being they're worried about the the American Asthma Society is worried about people who are asthmatic being exposed to so many different kinds of pet dander on flights, and that would mm-hmm. be really tragic if you had. I mean, you would had you could have a medical emergency. Absolutely, you know, and I have to jump in because I have a friend who's a veterinarian who can't be around animals now. She's so allergic; it causes life threatening allergic reactions. And and, and I saw her recently. We, and people have to do interference to make sure the service people service dogs aren't nearby. It would be devastating to her her, her life. Now, let so, me get this straight. She's a veterinarian. No longer, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, she is a veterinarian. Um, she trained. Um, this wasn't didn't appear until well into her um, higher secondary education after she had her degree and she was good, pursuing higher uh, a PhD beyond that. But I guess the point is, I didn't realize that for so many people, you know, I, I feel bad for people like this. And I would encourage folks that are just taking advantage of the system in this way to really stop and think until you know somebody whose life is in jeopardy, just because you want to fly your dog with you, I, I think I have a totally different and perspective. No- Charge. Well, yeah. how does she practice? She doesn't. She's she's in a non-practice uh, situation, but she uses her degree. So, um, it, it, I mean, it happens. You know, she, she didn't know this when she was young. She always wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, you, you deal the cards that you're dealt with. Um, and, you know, what does she do? Go back and find another degree and spend all that money, get another career? Workman's <laughs> comp. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, that's that's a strange now story. But I see cons- both sides now. Consult. Yeah. 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 All right. Alaskan Malamute Kiki, have you guys heard of this guy? <laughs> No. He's known as China's richest dog and is now the apparent owner of eight brand new iPhone 7s. Why? <laughs> oh, man. Really? I, I'm, I'm totally honest here. We don't know why, but maybe because 7 isn't enough for Kiki if you're the richest dog in China. Oh. Kiki is also a, a social media sensation there, and he belongs to the son of one of China's most powerful and wealthiest property moguls and has over a million online followers, plus his own personal blog on China's biggest social network. And it's huge. It has more than 500 million active users. So the 28-year-old billionaire, who is the owner of Kiki, has previously posted photos of Kiki wearing pure gold Apple watches, worth more than $33,000. And in China, that really angered, I think even here it would, angered (laughs) a lot of people. Uh, but it's not the dog's fault, right? Kiki's super rich human grandfather, by the way, is the chairman of China's largest commercial property company, and he is worth nearly $29 billion. And they say that puts Grandpa among the 20 richest people on the planet, according to Forbes. Wow. And you know what? Jeez. I think he only really needs like two iPhones. Just two. Just, I don't yeah. think, I think eight's overboard, really, for a yeah, dog. I, I do. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I'm Lori Brooks. Be sure to keep it here for important stories like that, okay? Get more breaking animal news anytime you need it at AnimalRadio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. Hi friends, this is Dr. Marty Becker, America's veterinarian. As you know, going to the vet can be a traumatic experience for your pet, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, vet visits can be something your pet looks forward to. Introducing Fear Free. When your veterinarian is Fear Free certified, you will be assured your pet's vet visit is more free of fear, anxiety, and stress than ever before. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified, and it puts the treat into treatment. To find a certified Fear Free veterinarian near you, go to fearfreepets.com. 
Hey, Jermaine. Hey, I have a question regarding um, domesticated and wild cats. Are they able to mate? Are they able, biology-wise, able to mate? Well, I, you know, okay, are they able to mate and produce a litter? It is conceivable. Now, when you're talking about wild cats, are you talking about things like lynxes or bobcats, right. things like that? Yes, it's, it is certainly possible. However, I kind of would term that a de- dangerous liaison, if I could, um, because your average uh, wild cat and domestic cat, if they meet up, it's not going to be a good outcome for the domestic cat. Unless we're dealing with, you know, human intervention or cats that have been kind of raised in uh, different environments uh, where they're used to human handling. But, yeah, it is, it's certainly possible. And there are a lot of breeds out there that are actually new exotic cat breeds where they kind of breed a, a semi-wild uh, cat into that of a domestic short hair. So it is possible. Why do you ask? i got to ask. Well, I had, um, I had a, a cat show up on my, on my deck. And uh, at first I thought it was a, a wild thing, um, uh-huh. and uh, he has a bob tail. But then oh. I discovered he's neutered, <laughs> and uh, he's declawed as well. He's okay. huge. He is huge. And uh-huh. uh, he's got this bob tail. He has no tufts. He's got, like, rabbit fur and a black stripe down his spine. Uh-huh. Sure he's not a skunk. Oh, I guess that would be a white, yeah, really. white skunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as far as you know, the skunks and the cats don't breed, uh-huh. uh, no. <laughs> thankfully. I was just curious because of his size and his coat that, mm-hmm. you know, he just looks semi-wild. Sure. And, you know, a lot of these uh, hybrid breeds, um, that's, you know, some of the look they're going for is something that looks and retains the look of the wild cat and has the size and the, you know, cuteness of the house cat. So I'm not a huge fan of hybrid cats. Um, Now, equally, we see some very huge domestic cats out there, um, you know, just in the Maine Coons, as well as the Norwegian Mountain Cats. Both of those breeds of cat can get around 25 pounds, so they can be a pretty sizable kitty and just be a regular old domestic house cat. So um, I'd be curious to know, though, um, and even if you could catch a picture of this kitty, I'd love to take a look, because there are some breeds like the Pixie Bob, which is basically a bobcat mixed with a domestic short hair, and uh, they kind of have a little bit of a bobcat kind of look about them, and they're kind of interesting. So, yeah, if you get a picture, I'd yeah, love, I'd to, love see. to see that, too. have to say, if he is, you know, a hybrid breed, um, one of the first things I'd say is I'd check him for a microchip, because some of the hybrid breeds could go up to five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, so they are not a cheap pet, and if someone lost them, they would be looking very dearly for them. Right. The Movie Man Six Second Review starts now. It doesn't fly like the Pixar movies, but with enough cute characters and goofy jokes, Stork still delivers. I mean, just because you don't have time to read a book doesn't mean you can't enjoy stories about artists and groups that you love. To discover a whole new world of audiobooks and hear the stories that made the music, visit HappylandAudio.com. That's HappylandAudio.com. You're listening to Animal Radio. If you missed any part of today's show, visit us at AnimalRadio.com or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. (laughs) It's Animal Radio. This is where we celebrate the connection with our pets. Toll free 1-866-405-8405 to reach out to Dr. Debbie or dog father Joey Volani. And we'll go back to the phones in just a couple of minutes. But first, we want to visit with America's favorite bi-coastal dog trainer, Emmy Award-winning. Brandon McMillan is joining us. Hey, Brandon, are you there? I'm here. Hey, Brandon, how are you doing? Good. I wanted to thank you so much for being part of Fido Friendly's Get Your Licks on Route 66 tour and congratulate you on how well Lucky Dog is doing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's uh, it's it's not broken. Let's just say that. <laughs> no, it's far from broken. And you have a brand new book out called Lucky Dog Lessons, and it's kind of like a fundamental book, isn't it? It's it's like uh, seven commands that every dog should know, like sit and down and come or off or heal or no, get away from that. The basic exactly. one. Exactly. I you know I'm a firm believer of, of less is more in dog training. Yeah. Um, in other words. I like to teach the dog. I like to really focus and solidify the commands that are just very important. And, you know, look, tricks are fun, but tricks are for kids. When it comes to <laughs> – I had this book in my head for years. Sure. Harper approached me, and they said, listen, we want you to write a dog training book 
I thought to myself, you know what, all right, I'm going to find out what's out there because I have a lot of information to give out, but I want to make sure that I'm not repeating every other book that's ever been written. I went out there and I bought every top selling dog training book in the past like 10, 15 years. <laughs> wow. There's got to be a lot of them. Exactly. And so what I did was I, I did a lot of research and I'm like, all right, I know what's out there and I know exactly what I'm going to put out there now because because every, every command that I teach, I've got 10 different ways to teach it. So I wasn't worried that, oh, no, it's all been written. And I also had to keep in mind that the average reader who's going, who's going to buy this book, they're not going to be the advanced trainer. So I had to also dip back into, okay, let's, let's write this to where, you know, even the most novice dog trainer, dog handler, dog owner, they're going to understand. So I, I literally wanted to write it where a 12-year-old could read this book and they could train their dog. My dog won't learn how to come. I mean, she'll come, you know, 25% of the time when nothing else is going on. But if there's something else out there a little more exciting, she won't come. And I've tried some of the basic things. But you give me several different techniques, several different ways to try this, not just a one-size-fits-all? Oh, yeah. Now, now, what I really try to drill into your brain the very beginning of the book is um, we talk about variables. I, open, I pretty much open the book up with the variables of dog training. And this comes down to breeds breed, uh, personality. It comes down to history of where the dog was. In other words, let's say you have a beagle. Um, yeah, it might be pretty tough to teach that dog to come because we're not <laughs> dealing with a shepherd. We're not dealing with like a border collie. We're dealing with a dog that basically has a nose far more powerful than just about any other dog breed out there. So this is what I say um, in the book. There's a variables, whether it's breed, whether it's their personality, whether it's their history. And so if you're having a hard time teaching your dog to come, let's take your breed into consideration. I don't know what kind of dog you do have, but I, I always I always say take all these things into consideration. And then, when once we know all the fundamentals, go to the uh, to the the chapter labeled "Come." And there's there's two or three ways I teach your dog to come. One of those is going to work. I, one of the things that I see, like yesterday, I was at the park. This big German Shepherd came up to me and started uh, pawing me and coming, uh, you know, getting on his hind legs and. And uh, reaching up to me, and it was it was very friendly, and I wasn't scared or anything like that. But the owner was trying to get the dog off, but was actually showering attention upon the dog, maybe even rewarding the dog for this. And this, I think, is like one of the biggest uh, disconnects there is in training. Exactly, I see that every day. Um, in fact, I was just at a I was at a sidewalk cafe a couple of weeks ago, and a woman had a dog. It was barking excessively, and it was really annoying everyone. It was barking out of control, actually. But the way she was uh, getting it to, uh, to keep quiet was she was giving it treats. So technically, yes, yeah, she was keeping it quiet for 20 seconds as it was chewing, but it, uh, she was in turn, <laughs> hey, every time I bark, I get a $5 bill. <laughs> and so rewarding, rewarding bad behavior. And, and the funny thing is most people don't even realize you're doing it until you explain it to them. This is, this is what you're doing because they don't understand their dog, uh, their dog treats are like, are like money. It's like currency, uh -huh. you know, so – and that's how dogs work. They get paid by this, by this, you know, their form of currency. And they don't, people don't realize they're rewarding bad behavior. And this is why they need a dog trainer, because you need to almost explain to them the, the obvious. You know what I'm saying? They just don't see it. You know, I think one of the biggest things that's really confused people the last couple of years, maybe the last decade or so, is there's a couple of different styles of dog training. And there's been a, a couple of very popular dog trainers. We have uh, Caesar Milan and we have yep. Victoria Stilwell. And their techniques are completely opposite. One is a reward-based training. And one is a discipline-based training. I think people get confused. How do I train my dog? Is it reward based or discipline based? Well, technically, they do both work. They do both work. I choose to go a little more right in the middle of the road. Sure. And the and the reason why it did, look it depends on your dog and it depends on the issue. So let's say if a dog is is um if a dog is highly aggressive, I mean obviously what are you going to do? Keep rewarding him for, for fighting? Yeah. So you have to do a little more of a firm discipline uh, style training. You can't go too far because you might make the dog worse. But doing purely positive um, uh, against a, a highly aggressive dog, I've never seen that work in the history of dog training. So you have to find that middle of the ground, and that's really where my—that's really where you know the foundation of my training goes. It's uh, I'm, I'm very fair when I'm when I'm training dogs, and I make sure I never push the dog past the limit of what I you know what I feel comfortable or what I think the dog is comfortable with. I made my own style. I love it, and it's in the book, brand new book called Lucky Dog Lessons. Just like the TV show, the CBS TV show, Lucky Dog Lessons. 
In fact, I think we have 10 copies to give away right now, toll free at 1-866-405-8405. Thanks so much for joining us, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it, guys. Always good. We'll see you next week for more Animal Radio right here. Have a great week. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is Animal Radio Network.